Hi, this is Dr. Coates again. This is part two of the uh, new criticism, the second new criticism lecture about figures, and here I'm going to take up uh, metaphor and ambiguity um, before referring you to a few screencasts where I illustrate some of these concepts in more depth with examples from the second module. So, here we go with metaphor. Uh, metaphor is the umbrella term for a series of figurative tropes, uh, which, like irony, use one aspect of language to stand in for and refer to another. Um, bequeathing a, it's a subtly different meaning because of its presence. So here we go, the uh, metaphorical tropes, I'm sorry, no, figurative tropes include things like similes, metaphors, metonym, personification, and synecdoche. These, these are all examples of tropes, and if you're wondering how to spell some of those, especially synecdoche, uh, do take a look at the transcript. Uh, for today. So similes, most of you know these things, but I, I just wanted to um, you know, go over them in, in great detail just in case these are new to you. Similes are uh, what we call an informational trope, which means it's a figure that is used in order to tell some, somebody something more about something that we assume they don't know all that much about. So for example, uh, let's say I go to Jamaica, and you've never been to Jamaica, and you ask me, what was it like? And I say, well, it was hot as, you know, and you don't know how hot Jamaica was, but the thing that I'm going to say, the simile, would have to be something that I assume you know more about. So it would be like, it was, every day was hot as a July day in Virginia, you know? And I assume that you're a Virginian, if I say that. And um, that, that's pretty much how it works. Uh, similes are function using like or as to connect the unfamiliar with the familiar. So you would, it, you know, one thing that you can do if you get a simile is to try to to scrutinize whether or not the author actually has used something that you know more about in order to tell you about the, um, the unfamiliar concept. But most of the time when we use this in everyday language, you know, similes you know, work fairly straightforwardly. Um, but in, in terms of the last lecture I just gave you, um, how do the soldiers die in World War I? They die as cattle, being ignominiously slaughtered. All right? That is simile. Personification performs a similar role, though it functions by applying human characteristics to any concept or object or any, anything really that is non-human, such as April being the cruelest month, right? Um, it, it's not, there, there's no way that April itself could be cruel because it doesn't have human emotions, it's a month of the year, right? So that's an example of personification. Um, and if I wanted to, I could, I could even specify that further because, you know, literary critics do these types of things. Um, the last example of April being cruel is actually something called the pathetic fallacy, uh, which is not a new critical term at all, but was invented by the 19th century art critic John Ruskin to, de uh, to describe any sort of situation where you're putting human emotion on the natural landscape. So, for example, if you look up at a mountain and you, you feel like it's glowering down at you, uh, the mountain is not glowering down at you. It's probably not even angry because it's made of rock. Um, but, you know, when you, when you look at a lot of landscapes like Ruskin did, and you come up with terms like this in order to describe what's going on. Um, metonym, metonym, M-E-T-O-N-Y-M, is another trope in which something is referred to by the use of another thing which is commonly and physically associated with it. So, for example, if I am a royal tax collector and I come around and I say, I'm collecting taxes on behalf of the crown, if we lived in a kingdom like England, right? Uh, because kings wear crowns. But you would not be confused about suddenly owing taxes to some headwear. Got it? You, you, would, you, would, you would hear crown and you would think king. I'm, I'm, or queen, I guess. Someone who wears the crown. Uh, but the important thing is that there is this sort of physical, um, usually an object relationship. Um, so, for example, my, you know, my wedding ring symbolizes uh, the, the fact that um, I'm married, right? But, I mean, I could, I could also just you know, like point to the, the ring... And this actually happens in Adrian Rich's poem, Aunt Jennifer's Tigers. Uh, you know, it says the massive weight of, upon, of her wedding band it makes it difficult for her hands to go through the loom. And it, it, it's it really talking about marriage, or at least a, a specific kind of marriage, which is oppressive. So um, that is the preview of Coming Attraction. I know some of you are going to be talking about that poem, and I hope I haven't just said too much because I don't want to re-record this. <laughs> All right. Um, finally, synecdoche is a subspecies of metonymy in which you refer to the whole by use of the part. Uh, so such as in the naval expression, all hands on deck, which maybe you haven't heard before because you haven't been in the Navy, and neither have I, but I've, I've heard of the expression. The expectation is that the sailors, all of the sailors, will appear on the deck 
uh, with all their body parts intact rather than just like they, they won't they don't have them in order to cut their hands off and throw them up on deck okay I mean an absurd example but th these are examples of how it works um, now proper metaphors do not use like or as um, and in fact they are not informational tropes at all they're what we call a substitution trope um, because instead of telling you something about something you don't know about by giving you something that you know more about it's simply placed there in and you have to infer the relationship okay um, someone is making an equation between two unlikely things so someone could say he is a doormat or because he whoever that is is being troped as somebody who lets people walk all over him or you could say she is a gazelle where she you know the little like an antelope right where uh, whoever she is is exceptionally fast like a gazelle um, or I suppose if you're being ironic, uh, she's exceptionally slow, right? Like a not gazelle, like a turtle, um, right? Okay. Uh, the word, the image, activity, or concept that appears within the text is called the vehicle. The vehicle, like my automobile is a vehicle. Um, in this case, that is doormat or gazelle for those examples I just gave. Um, the other idea, activity, or concept that it has substituted itself for is known as the tenor. Um, and in this case, that would be he or she, right? So he is a doormat. Doormat is the vehicle. He is the tenor. Um, actually, sorry. Doormat is the vehicle. Um, someone who lets people walk all over him is the tenor. Gazelle is the vehicle. And, ex uh, you know, fast animal like an antelope is the tenor, right? So you hear these things, but you think... Um, uh, we, we think you think pushover or speedy, rather you know rather than focusing endlessly on the word itself. That's how metaphors work. So again, the vehicle is the thing that you point to within the text for evidence. The tenor is the idea that you infer, and that's your gloss. Does that make sense? Um, a proper metaphorical pair of tenor and vehicle has a clear principle of substitution. No one mistakes the fact that the vehicle is meant to convey an important characteristic about the tenor rather than describing some bizarre metamorphosis. So you don't think, this person has become a doormat. What a horrible thing. You know, you don't think that. You just think, oh, you're, you're using artful figures in order to tell me more about this, this person's character. Um, but on the other hand, we shouldn't ignore the consequences of the presence of the vehicle as such. I mean, um, if I use gazelle to describe your speed, right, that there are other things that I could, I could have used that are also speedy. Um, and you'd have to assume whether or not you, you think the, uh, is the gazelle a graceful animal rather than, you know, let's say I would, maybe I, I could have used the Concorde jet, uh, which is not a great example, but I mean, it, it certainly doesn't convey any of the grace that the gazelle does, right? It's, um, on the other hand, it would have like a technological speed. So maybe I'm calling you a robot or something like that, or maybe it's like you're, you're a machine, you know, and, and the, the vehicle does have consequences is what I want to emphasize here. In terms of content, we assimilate the information about the tenor and we move on, but the presence of the vehicle within the text often suggests resonances that cannot or at least should not be dismissed too easily. Sometimes we may begin thinking that the tenor-vehicle coupling is informational, um, but arbitrary, right? Uh, but then later on, we learn that there was actually more of a relationship than we had at first expected between the two. Uh, in which case, then, the metaphor becomes to resemble as we read on, especially for a long poem or a novel or something like that, something more like metonymy, uh, where there is that, you know, contiguity between the object or the, the figure and the person that it represents, right? Or if I kept calling you a gazelle over and over and over again, right, um, then I would start to be, it becomes more like an epithet or, or something which is linked to that character uh, rather than just like a one-time... Uh, substitution artful way of describing your speed okay so so that is, is something you also need to pay attention to um, and in, in truth the screencast that's linked to this one about John Donne's poem the flea um, takes this the next step and, uh, and a metaphor that is used consistently um, in which you can't you can't read the poem sensitively without grappling with its metaphoricity is called a conceit especially when the comparison that's being made are between two incredibly unlikely things, like the flea and this love affair, um, which, you know, usually don't think about, you know, hideous fleas as, um, as being all that romantic. Uh, but in this case, John Dunn did, so we have to deal with it. Okay. Um, 
when the vehicle might stand in for two tenors, we have an instance of what we call ambiguity, which is the third and last section for this, this lecture. Uh, when the vehicle stands in for something, but it's impossible to know precisely what, what we call that then is indeterminacy. Uh, this is, however, extremely rare, and I, one, one thing that I notice often with introductory classes is that students tend to jump to, oh, it's indeterminate, I can't know what it means, uh, when really you just need to think about it a little bit more. So, so try not to give up on deducing the tenor of a vehicle uh, too soon, okay? On the other hand, there's, there's another way of thinking about this too, which is that some metaphors are so commonly used um, that they actually rely much more on common parlance than they do about the, the context that the text pr provides for that, right? So in that, I actually already used this one, like the wedding ring as a symbol of a marriage is an extremely uh, commonly used metaphor or metonym, if you like. Um, and as I, I even said it as I was describing it, we call that then a symbol. That is a metaphor that is a uh, tenor and vehicle pair which is extremely commonly used, right? To the point where the meaning is really outside of the text rather than inside of it. Um, here the associative power of language trumps a text's attempt to create an instantaneous new, you know, one time only uh, coupling of a tenor and vehicle. A symbol is a metaphor whose resonances is excuse me, whose resonances rely as much or more on the reader than the text to provide its meaning, because that meaning comes from outside the text. Like the like the wedding ring. Um, in each case of metaphor, when you are when you are writing about poems, be sure to specify the relationship between the tenor and the vehicle. Right? This is the vehicle. This is what I think it means. That kind of thing. And that's a great example of a gloss. Um, and the consequences of the use of that particular vehicle to stand in for the tenor. Okay? Kings often wear gold crowns, but there may be nothing particularly golden about the king himself, uh, unless I guess he's Midas. Um, calling all hands on deck instead of all toes on deck probably has something to do with the nature of the, the type of skilled work that's, be, that's being required up on deck. Um, and the use of either doormat or gazelle, as I talked a little bit earlier with gracefulness versus roboticness, carries with it a negative or positive connotation that we should also take notice of. So, so these are all things to be thinking about anytime you want to talk about a metaphor within a text. Um, and I don't mean this as like a you know, like a harsh reminder that you have to fulfill these, these certain obligations, but, but merely to say that there's a lot going on anytime someone uses a metaphor or is being ironic, or as I'll say in just a second, it, um, has done something which makes a moment in the text be ambiguous, and that actually gives us more to say rather than uh, more rules to follow, okay? So part of the point here is just to, to allow you, to equip you to say a lot about something which may not even take up all that much space on the page. So, yeah, good news, I hope. All right, so lastly, I want to talk to you about ambiguity. Ambiguity is the condition that results from the denotative process, uh, the process of using words to convey ideas or meanings, um, yields an alternate meaning. Right? So I think I'm saying one thing, um, and I mean, in, in this case, not in, in, it, as with verbal irony, where I'm saying one thing but meaning another, but one thing is said, and then there's, um, there, there are at least two possibilities that can result from that moment. Uh, one of the new critics named William Empson, who's also a poet himself, devoted an entire book called Seven Types of Ambiguity to cataloging this effect. He really loved it, apparently. And there are at least seven, I have to agree. When ambiguity seems intentional, as is often the case, we might appraisingly call it polysignation, because you're using um, you know, the, the, the function of language that allows us to you know, mean all things at once. Um, when it's funny, we call it a pun. Or if, you're, if you want to be fancy pants, paranomasia, but pun also works. Uh, here is an exa exemplary couplet from Alexander's <laughs> Alexander Pope's mock epic, The Dunciad, which contains a pun. Um, quote, Where Bentley late tempestuous want to sport in troubled waters, but now sleeps in port. Right? The fact that it starts with in troubled waters might make you think that he's a ship who, which is docked in a port. Um, but also, uh, and if you knew anything about Bentley, or the, the character, and it's actually meant to refer to somebody at court that, that Pope was making fun of so that he would become humiliated, um, he was a drunk. So, um, now sleeps in port also has that other ambiguous meaning of port, which is that it's a double fortified, fairly sweet wine. So he drank a lot of port, and now he's asleep because he's drunk. Ha ha ha! What a witty guy that Alexander Pope was. Um, but ambiguity can also seem irregular or uncomfortable, discomforting, contrary to sense, unintentional, 
uh, or problematic, especially to someone who's not used to dealing with it, or it doesn't get intrigued or delighted whenever you see it. So, um, the more pressure, I, I guess what I want to say is that ambiguity is not a bug. It, it's something that's planned and intentional and, and fortuitous, and something that um, I hope that I, I can convince you to embrace rather than to despise. Um, because it is, a, again, just a, um, a normal consequence of language. And, and it's also a normal consequence of performing close readings, because the closer, or the more pressure you apply to any text, uh, the, the close, more closely you, um, you scrutinize language, the more it's going to open up and yield these alternate meanings, right? Um, now, of course, you have, to, uh, you have to pay close attention to the context to make sure that the things that you want to say actually are sponsored by the text rather than sort of idiosyncratic things that you're bringing up that no one else would find, right? So, like, for example, if I didn't know that by, by the context of the rest of that poem by, by Pope that I was supposed to be um, thinking humorously about Bentley's um, lack of sobriety, right, then I might think, well, maybe port doesn't actually mean the wine. But because later on it becomes clear, um, then it is, it is a pun, it is ambiguous. Both of those meanings are meant. So, again, I mean, as in all cases, please avoid the affective fallacy and make sure that the text does sponsor the amb ambiguous reading. Um, so if the alternatives do seem apt, then try to read the text as if both meanings are summoned for the reader at once. So, not, so don't do it like, here's what it means by meaning number one, and then alternatively, here's what it means by meaning number two. Think about it after you've done that process as both these things are conjured at the same time. It means both. Um... This guy is like a ship, and he's also drunk. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's like a ship that's about to crash because the captain is drunk, right? So it, in both cases, um, it's a bad scene for Bentley, uh, or because of Bentley. Um, but, I mean, I actually, if you're thinking about both of them, them at once, then it's even worse for him. It is sometimes... Oh, let's see here. Um, if the alternatives seem apt, we will call those nuances and resonances, right? This is here, plus I got this added nuance. That that's one way of referring to an ambiguity or an, an alternate ambiguous meaning. Um, it is sometimes a function of language rather than the individual text's apparent project. But in any case, remember that ambiguity is... Um, I'm sorry, that it's only the task of the new critic to test the text to see what meanings are present, not to account for the authorial intention, or at least not to feel sanguine about being able to say, this is what Pope meant, right? Um... Instead, it's the language leads me to think that there are these two alternate meanings available here. Let me see if there's any context that can back up that, right? Because, again, you're not trying to, to have a seance with Pope or to call him up on the phone. Uh, you're just trying to attend to the evidence that you see on the page. Okay? So one last thing about ambiguity. If you look up the dictionary definition for the term, you will see that it has the, the prefix root ambi, um, which, again, means both rather than two. Uh, the bi means two, but, but ambi is actually the Latin for round or around. Um, so, and, and we translate as both. Two options present themselves, and the careful reader attends to both of them at the same time. Even if the context allows you to drop one eventually, the alternate reading still lingers in the background and ought to inform your interpretation. At any rate, for the purposes of literary study, you should assume that the text you are reading is an intentional thing, that resonances and nuances attend language because that's what happens whenever language is used, rather than because the author goofed. Uh, so don't confuse ambiguity with vagueness or incompetence on the part of the author. Uh, use it instead to identify places where the instabilities of language um, are storing up energy within the text by housing simultaneous meanings. Also, as an instance of a place where the text is signaling to you that you should sit up and pay attention. Because here is a crucial detail that will need to be attended to in, in more depth. So, in other words, as I've said for irony and metaphor, anytime you suspect there's an ambiguity, please make sure to point exactly to see the exact place within the text where you suspect the thing is being ambiguous and then list both meanings, uh, which is fairly straightforward. But if you don't specify, if you just say this is ambiguous without saying what the two meanings are, uh, then you risk you know, more confusion than if you didn't talk about it at all. So the, the point of attending to any of these three figures is to be absolutely clear with your interpretation uh, rather than the opposite. All right, well, that's all I have to say about those, those three figures. Um, Please pay attention, um, sorry, don't pay attention, I mean, yes, do pay attention to them, but please see that there are some attached screencasts that read through poems with an eye towards these three, um, and then I will get back to you next week. Oh, and don't forget, too, the uh, Twitter conversations, and you have a journal entry due for me by Friday night.